One of the most famous Bible stories may have originated from a translation error. Were you aware of this? We have been informed for ages that God made Eve from a rib taken from Adam. What if, however, the Hebrew text reveals an alternative story, one that might alter your perspective on the entire creation story? A word that has been twisted for generations has its true meaning revealed as we delve into the Hebrew scriptures today. In reality, what is its meaning? Is it merely a rib, or could it represent something deeper? We'll look into old creation stories, find out what archaeology has to say, and bring to light the profound theological implications that got lost in translation. This is about more than just a word, it's about rediscovering God's initial plan for humankind to live in harmony and cooperation. This is the perfect spot for you if you've ever wanted to know if there's more to the tale than what you can see. Follow us to the conclusion as we reveal the truth about the Hebrew text, the enigma of Adam's rib, and the challenge to centuries of conventional wisdom. Do yourself a favor and don't miss this. Please hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and enable notifications so you won't miss an episode before we begin. Now is the time to begin if you are prepared to learn the truth about one of the most egregious mistranslations in the Bible. If you have any friends who also enjoy delving deeply into scripture, please share this video with them and leave a comment with your thoughts. Let us delve into the profound wisdom found in God's word side by side. First, we'll go over the well-known account of how Eve was made from a rib taken from Adam. Many have heard this story in Sunday school, read it in Bible studies, and seen it portrayed in art from all over the world. Genesis 2 verses 21 to 22 contains the narrative. As a result, God put the man to sleep, and while he was fast asleep, he removed one of his ribs and used flesh to seal the wound. Then the Almighty joined the man with the woman he had created from the man's rib. Historically, people have taken this verse at face value. After creating Eve from Adam's rib bone, God gave her to Adam to be his companion. The reading is simple, but the imagery packs a punch. By implying that Eve was formed from a portion of Adam, it brings attention to the special relationship between the sexes and creates an atmosphere of closeness during the creation process. As time went on, this understanding became ingrained in Christian culture and tradition. A common interpretation of the rib story is that it symbolizes the inseparability of husband and wife, who are considered one flesh, literally bound together by the rib bone. The story has been used as a metaphor for men and women's complementary relationship in sermons. Traditionally, the belief that Eve was fashioned from a rib of Adam has been interpreted as a sign that woman was created to be loved and protected by man. There are a lot of pictures of Adam dozing off as God takes a rib from his side in literature and art. Renaissance paintings, for example, frequently emphasize the divine act of creation by dramatizing this scene. The literal interpretation has been strengthened and many Christians' conceptions of woman's origins have been influenced by this imagery. I don't understand why this view is so popular. There are a number of reasons why the conventional wisdom about Adam's rib has endured. First of all, the story is easy to remember and recount because of how simple it is. This simple account of God's creation of woman is consistent with the rest of Genesis. Additionally, the teachings of the Bible about marital unity are supported by the concept of the rib. For example, in Matthew 19 verse 5, Jesus says, This is why a man will forsake his parents and join his wife in matrimony. After they are married, they will become one flesh. The symbolism of Eve being formed from Adam's body is further emphasized when this verse is linked to the Genesis account. On the other hand, there are a few unforeseen effects associated with the conventional view. Some cultural stereotypes regarding women's roles and worth have their roots in the long-held belief that they were formed from a tiny, apparently insignificant bone. Some have used it incorrectly to suggest that women are less valuable or subordinate to men due to their origins in a tiny, insignificant portion of a man's body. However, what if a mistranslation forms the basis of this interpretation? Is it possible that a more profound and hidden meaning is revealed by the original Hebrew text? Things start to get intriguing at this point. The Hebrew word for rib may have a far more important meaning when we examine it in context with the original language. Examining the original Hebrew word used in Genesis 2 verses 21 to 22 will reveal the deeper meaning behind the creation of Eve. The word zela, which means rib in most English translations of the Bible, is crucial here, but the meaning of the original text might not be conveyed in this translation. Researching the Hebrew text and its context in the Old Testament reveals an alternative account. In Hebrew, what is the literal meaning of zela? 
A rib bone is not commonly referred to as a zella. A more exact word, such as etsum, which means bone, would have been appropriate if the author of Genesis had meant to describe a rib. We go with zella instead. The Old Testament contains 40 plus occurrences of this word. Surprisingly, the word almost never means rib and is instead used to describe the side of something, be it a building, an object, or even a person. The sides of the tabernacle, a holy building the Israelites constructed as a place of worship while wandering in the desert, are described as zella in Exodus 26 verse 20. And twenty boards shall be provided for the north side of the tabernacle, which is the second side. It is evident that zella is referring to an entire side here, not just one rib. Rather than referring to something insignificant like a rib, the usage of zella to describe the sides of the tabernacle implies that it indicates support and integral structure, befitting a sacred and important building. The usage of zella to describe the sides of Solomon's temple in 1 Kings 6 verse 5 further supports this broader meaning. He constructed side chambers, zella, all around the house, against the walls of the nave and the inner sanctuary, against the walls of the house. In this context, the word zella clearly denotes a side chamber or even an entire side of the building, further highlighting its role as an auxiliary component. Then why does the Genesis account use the word rib? The reason the Hebrew word zella is rendered as rib in numerous modern Bible translations can be better understood by tracing its origins to the earliest Greek versions of the Old Testament, specifically the Septuagint. An important influence on biblical interpretation in the Greek-speaking world and beyond was this old translation, finished in the 3rd century BCE. In order to serve the vast Jewish diaspora population residing outside of Israel, Jewish scholars in Alexandria, Egypt, compiled the Septuagint by translating the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. After Alexander the Great's conquests, Greek became the regional language of choice, allowing Jews who were no longer proficient in Hebrew to better understand and use the scriptures. The Septuagint translators substituted the Greek word plura for the Hebrew word zella in Genesis 2 verse 21. The Greek word plura can mean side or rib cage, both of which are important choices, so this isn't just any old word. The original Hebrew text did not contain the ambiguity that was created by the dual meaning of plura. The Greek-speaking world was misled into picturing a real rib being removed from Adam's body due to this translation, even though the Hebrew word zella usually meant a side rather than a particular bone. That was not the end of the Septuagint's impact. In the late 4th century CE, the early Christian scholar Jerome used the Septuagint and the Hebrew texts extensively in his Latin translation of the Bible. For more than a millennium, his Vulgate translation served as the de jure Bible for the Western Christian Church. According to the Vulgate, Jerome rendered the Latin word plura as casta, meaning rib. The anatomical knowledge of his day and the Greek text he was referring to probably played a role in this decision. Jerome strengthened the belief that God created Eve from a rib bone from Adam by translating Zella as Casta. Countless medieval manuscripts, religious texts, and canonical traditions continued to use this reading. Now we jump ahead to the early 17th century, when the English version of the King James Bible was published. Considering the historical and theological climate in which the KJV translators worked, it is clear that the Latin Vulgate had a significant impact. The rib significance in Christian iconography and thought had grown so ingrained by this point that it was practically beyond dispute. Following the Vulgate's lead, the KJV translators translated Zella as rib, solidifying this meaning for English-speaking audiences. There was a major effect from this decision. One of the most famous and influential Bible translations of all time was the King James Version. Throughout the years, it served as the main source for countless English-speaking Christians molding their perception of biblical narratives, such as the account of Eve's creation. Although the original Hebrew text implies something far broader, the side of Adam, a notion with deeper and more symbolic meaning, the idea of the rib became a component of Christian doctrine, taught in churches, and depicted in art. The wide-ranging implications of translating zella as rib instead of side extend beyond the realm of biblical interpretation and into the realm of cultural and theological understandings of gender roles. Many people believe that woman is a secondary creation, descended from a tiny and insignificant portion of man, because of the imagery of Eve being formed from a single rib bone. This reading has helped perpetuate patriarchal beliefs in the church and beyond, which hold that women are inherently inferior to males. When we change the definition of zella from rib to side, the theological significance of Genesis creation account begins to change. 
Instead of God taking just a tiny fragment of Adam's bone to make Eve, this view proposes that he took an entire side of Adam, including his flesh, bone, and spirit, to make a partner who was equal to and complementary to him. As a central tenet of biblical teaching on relationships and marriage, this idea is of great importance because it highlights the equality and oneness of man and woman. Genesis 2 verse 24 strongly supports this view, as it states. That is the reason a man gives up his independence from his parents and becomes fully devoted to his wife, the two of them become one flesh. Rather than being a lyrical depiction of marriage, the phrase one flesh in this verse is a proclamation of the prophetic character of the bond between sexes. Becoming one flesh, a Hebrew concept, represents a deep connection in which two people are no longer seen as separate entities but as an integrated whole, signifying an intimate and full-fledged partnership. There is no implied dominance or hierarchy in this unity. Rather, it is a balanced partnership in which each partner recognizes the other's worth and importance. By taking Zella at its value as side, we can view Eve's creation as a move toward gender parity in the beginning of time. From Adam's side came a woman, not as an afterthought or a lesser being, but as an essential counterpart who would stand by his side. The prophetic theme of oneness and equality is recurrent in the Bible, appearing in both the Old and New Testaments. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul continues the theme of man and woman being one in their marriage relationship by elaborating on the importance of mutual respect and unity. In the passage from Ephesians 5 verse 28 to 31, Wives, likewise, should be loved by their husbands as much as their own bodies. Any husband worth his salt will love his wife. No one has ever despised their own flesh, rather they nourish and care for it, just as Christ feeds and cares for the church. There is a deep spiritual truth about marriage that Paul reveals in his words. Paul stresses how interdependent men and women are by telling husbands to love their wives as themselves. A woman is created from the rib of a man, according to his teachings, which hearken back to the creation story in Genesis. Husbands owe it to their wives to treat them with the same tender loving care that they would give to their own bodies. Paul continues by drawing parallels between this union and the one Christ has with the church, comparing it to a marriage and how Christ's love for his people is reflected in it. This link highlights the idea that marriage is a selfless love bond in which each spouse sacrifices for the other. Paul's teachings on marriage in Ephesians mirror the egalitarian and cooperative ideals envisioned in Genesis, wherein one spouse completes the other and the union flourishes. There is deeper symbolic meaning in the act of creating Eve from Adam's side than what is immediately apparent in the story. Impartiality, or being made in God's image, is fundamental to making sense of these symbols. Verse 1 to 22 and 27 of Genesis state, And so God made man in his own likeness, male and female, according to his own image. A deep truth that stresses equality and dignity for all people is that this verse indicates that both men and women are made in the image of God. God emphasizes once again that both sexes are created in his image and are equally valuable by creating a woman from a man's rib. It is evident that God intended for humans to be united and equal when we look at Eve's creation from Adam's perspective. The fact that Adam and Eve were created to be one flesh yet ended up becoming two separate entities demonstrates how incomplete they would have been without the other. Many ancient cultures held that the polarities of day and night, of heaven and earth, or of men and women were interdependent and necessary to the whole, which is consistent with this concept. When God takes a side with Adam, he makes him a companion who can reflect God's image just as well. A common thread throughout the Bible is the importance of community and relationships, and this unity is meant to reflect that. The relationship between man and woman is called to be one of unity and mutual respect, just as the relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one of love and mutual support. This reading runs counter to the patriarchal worldview that has historically dominated many societies. Reading the creation story in its original context and language reveals that the Bible does not advocate a gender hierarchy. On the contrary, it paints a picture of harmony in which the sexes are to be seen as mirrors of God's image. The word zela, meaning side in Hebrew, encourages us to interpret the account of creation in Genesis as a message that stands in opposition to the cultural norms of its day, affirming the inherent worth of both sexes as created in God's image. Particularly when placed in the historical context of a time when women were frequently considered property or subservient to males, this message is shocking. But the story of creation lays out the groundwork for a partnership defined by mutual regard, equality, and purpose. 
A greater biblical narrative seeks restoration and wholeness, and the theme of unity between man and woman is a part of that. A repeated theme in the Bible is the need for people to get back to how God originally intended them to be. Because Christ came to reconcile people to God and one another, the equality and unity that the false shattered are finally restored. Paul reiterates this message of redemption and parity in Galatians 3 verse 28. In Christ Jesus, there is no longer any distinction between Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, male and female. For you are all one. This statement emphasizes the importance of embracing the unity that was intended from the beginning and overcoming social divisions through our faith in Christ. One interpretation is that the creation of Eve from Adam's side was a preview of this unity, a look at the perfect equality and harmony that God wants for all people. Linguists and biblical scholars have started to question the long-held view that Zella means rib, and have looked to the Hebrew text for a more precise interpretation. Through a careful examination of the context and wider usage of Zella in the Old Testament, they are uncovering a deeper understanding of woman's creation, one that places an emphasis on equality, partnership, and unity rather than subordination and hierarchy. This rediscovery is more than just a theoretical exercise, it could revolutionize our understanding of one of the Bible's central narratives. It challenges us to view the creation story through new lenses and to value the original Hebrew text for what it contains, a picture of man and woman as symbiotic partners, each reflecting God's image and serving a unique purpose. Looking at the original texts through the lens of the early translations shows how one word can impact a culture's beliefs and practices for generations. It compels us to seek knowledge in the original languages, delve further into the scriptures, and discover the genuine message that God intended for his people. Finally, the fascinating tale of Adam's rib demonstrates how translation errors can impact our interpretation of the Bible. Zela, a Hebrew word meaning partner or equality, alludes to a deeper meaning, the creation of a spouse from Adam's line. The significance of this finding extends far beyond mere semantics. It calls into question our current understanding of the role of women in biblical and contemporary contexts. It serves as a gentle reminder that the Bible is a multifaceted book brimming with mysteries, waiting to be explored with diligence and devotion. We appreciate you coming along with us as we explore the rich tapestry of biblical prophecy, archaeological sites, and history. It would mean a lot to me if you could subscribe, share this video, and give it a thumbs up if you thought it helped shed light on the Bible's secrets. Join me as we delve deeper into the profound teachings of the Bible.